thanks Amy for the warm welcome. So our talk is about femtosales. The title says poisonous needle in the operator's haystack. So how many guys you know about femtosales? Okay, so not many. So I need to go a thorough introduction about the femtosale and tele on how, how many guys are familiar with the telecommunication architecture? I mean, not about receiving calls, but some internal details. Okay, so we'll have a brief introduction also. So that's our, so what we're going to talk. So I will give an introduction about mobile telecommunication architecture, what's the 3G architecture, which is also called UMTS architecture, how the femtosale architecture is integrated into this new 3G architecture, and uh, how it looks like in a broader picture. And again, we will continue with the second half about the end user attacks. So we will tell you what kind of uh, attacks are possible against the end users from this comp uh, compromised femtosale. So we're going to root femtosale and we'll show what are the effects on the end users. Also on the network side, so what we can do in the operator's network by having access to the femtosale and through femtosale inside the operator's network. So that will be our agenda. So this looks like a UMTS architecture. Can you understand exactly or, okay. So it's a little bit complex actually. Too many elements, too many elements, too many haze like later uh, parts. It's too difficult to understand. So a simplified version looks like. So I will just give a short introduction in simple way. So the whole telecommunication architecture divided into three parts. The first part consists of the mobile station or like the mobile phone you use. So it has a SIM card inside, uh, which is connected towards the core network. The second part consists access network. Access networks means the tower which you see on a building. So these are a node week, these called, and these are the part of access network, and which, which connects to a radio network controller, which controls the tower traffic and which redirects. It acts as a link between mobile station and a core network, which connects back to the core network. And the core network consists of two parts. One is called circuit switch, like your all call traffic is handled in this uh, circuit switch network, and data traffic which tunnel towards the SGSN uh, for handling all the data traffic. So film to sale. So this is about a 3G architecture, and now they introduce the new technology which is called a film to sales. I guess in 2008, the uh, telecom, uh, telecom, uh, telecommunication operator started to roll out this product commercially. So these are the small access point. So it's like you buy a femtosale, like small access point, you can install at your home. And these are small devices which connects to the operator network over the internet. Uh, and these are compatible with all the UMTS phone. Like you might be aware of a UMA phone, UMA enabled phone, which are popular in US actually, but you need a special phone to connect over the Wi-Fi for uh, having a UMA access. But with this femtosale, you don't need any specialized phone. So any normal 3G phone can connect to a femtosale. Uh, these are very small sale, having a range of 50 meters, not very, uh, not very long, so 50 meters. Uh, these are very low power device and easy to install. You just buy, you put your uh, internet broadband connection, and off you go. Uh, and this device has a specific uh, standard name as per the 3GP standard. It's called Home Node B. So we have seen already this Node B. So this is a Home Node B. So install at your home, actually. That, that's, that's just the term come from Home, home Node B. And uh, what are the advantages for users to have this femtosales, actually? So when you buy, the, the greatest advantage is in your home, you have an improved 3G coverage. So when you connect your phone to this femtosale, you have a full five ranges of this bar you will see on your mobile. So you have a full coverage. You can uh, have a full data coverage. Uh, high bandwidth, high voice quality. Also, you have uh, add-on location-based services, like uh, they are trying to produce some location-based services, like you can have a features when your kids arrive at a home, you will get SMS from femtosale automatically, oh, your son is at home now. So it's like some location-based services. For operator, definitely greater advantage is uh, offloading traffic uh, traffic from their public infrastructure like they are coping with the higher requirements of a data so nowadays it's a challenge to provide a high bandwidth so they cannot install more uh, towers which you see on outside those are really ex expensive so these are the very cheap devices uh, compared uh, to a 3G normal base station uh, no installation cost no maintenance and it has IP connectivity so it's very easy uh, to install so how does the architecture looks like for the femtosales so we have seen earlier the, the, the access network part, which we have seen in UMTS, and this is the access network part in this new femtosale architecture. So we have a home node B, so which is, looks like this one. So this is a small device, which is called a femtosale. 
So this is a FEMS, uh, this is a FEMCO cell, uh, like a radio network controller. So we have in the access network we have a home node B gateway uh, and security gateway. So this time we are connecting this device over the internet. So it means it has to be protective. So this this is handled by security gateway, which protects the uh, uh, operating infrastructure from. Uh, threats from the public internet. Uh, and home node B gateway acts completely as a radio, not radio network controller, which links all your traffic inside the core network. So core network is as it is. They haven't changed anything inside the core network. Only the new element, that's the home node B gateway, security gateway, and the third part is the home node management system. So why they introduce this home management system? Because if something goes wrong inside your femtocell, you can remotely upgrade your femtocell. So you can push some configuration remotely, easily, uh, no maintenance cost, and you can easily reboot or just push new firmware into it. That's uh, easy to do. And they use standard this protocol. So we'll get into more detail by Kevin and uh, Nico. And some small history, if I give you about the sales. So already we have these micro cells, like a big cells. They require huge power. Uh, also, they have more signal, uh, more strength. So slowly, slowly, the size get decreased. Now we have cells. Then comes to uh, you. Have, you might have seen this uh, pico cells, this nano cells, femto cell, and this is the latest model they produce about the femto cell, which is which looks like an iPhone completely size up. So you can have your old personal base station. You connect your laptop, uh, connect to your laptop, and you can just uh, have your personal base station for calls. Okay, so this is about femtocell. So what is femtocell? What are the advantage? What are the disadvantage? But what about if femtocell get compromised? So what kind of threats will be happen towards the end users and towards the operators network? So 3GBP is a standard body who defines all the standards about GSM, 3G, LTE. Uh, they also define some threats, but these threats are very, very abstract threats, like what goes wrong, what are the physical attacks, what can go wrong if there are some protocol attacks, so which are re really extremely harmful for the operator or end users. They just categorize in different terms of view and their impact. So we'll, we'll tell you in practically how the impact is more dangerous. So Kevin will continue with the next section about the femtocell which we have. So <clears throat> now we've seen what femtocells are and we want to get one. To get a femtocell first you need a mobile phone subscription at your operator, and then you ask your operator, please, I don't have any coverage at home, can you send me a femtocell? We use the SFR operator, that's the second big in, biggest one in France, and when we got this femtocell, it was for 100 euro, so it's, it's quite cheap. You don't pay monthly, you just pay once this 100 euro, and then you have the femtocell at home, but you need the mobile phone subscription. That's the most important point, and that's why sometimes it's hard to get femtocells. <coughs> The device itself, it's, it's like a router. It's really inexpensive. They use some kernel, uh, kernel um, OS, and on top of that, they add software to speak the 3G communication, because it's not like just TCP IP. It's a special protocol for telecommunication, and that's why they add the software. <coughs> What's important here is that the femto cells are are constructed by the vendors. In this case, for SFR, the vendor is Ubiquisys. So Ubiquisys is, is giving the platform, he's giving all the software, he's param um, and he's responsible for flaws that occur in software. The operator, SFR, just takes the femtocell, places it in the home, and configures it. It doesn't push any software. It just says, OK, this is my gateway. This is how you connect to my operator. So meaning if there's a flaw in the device, the vendor is responsible. If there's a flaw in the network, then the operator is responsible. And we want to root it. And this is why we have to first find a flaw in the device itself. How we rooted it, we've seen, we've showed at the recovery process. Like we've already said, they don't want, they cannot come at home to reconfigure the femtocell. They have to somehow to reconfigure remotely. So if something is broken or if something happens, they just tell, press on the button on the back, that's the recovery button, it's like similar, similar than a factory reset. The femtocell will connect to the internet, grab the latest images, grab the latest configuration, and install on it. This way, it, have, uh, it should have a working image and connect to the network. How it works is the Fendo cell connects to the operation, administration, and maintenance server, the second one. First, it connects over HTTPS to request the configuration list. HTTPS because you want it to be secured. You don't want anyone to see how the Fendo cell is configured. That's why they use HTTPS. 
in this list there's the configuration, but also where all the images are. So once you get the, this list, you connect back to the, to the server and you get, can I get this image and so on and so on. Here they don't use HTTPS, they use simple HTTP because it's here easier to handle and all the firmwares are signed and encrypted. So even if you get the HTTP traffic, it's no use for you because it's encrypted. They are signed because um, the, the 3GPP requirements require this to be signed. It's a trusted element from the operator network at your home. So you want to be sure that only your images are getting flashed on this device. But we found several, several flaws in this, in this recovery procedure. The first one is to HTTPS. They only use a client certificate to be sure that a femtocell is requesting the image. Now, they don't, the femtocell doesn't verify the, the, the server, if it's the right server. So we provided our own server, the femtocell connected to our own server, and this way we could push our own configuration and give the own firmware list. You can see at, at the top here, uh, they give the certificate authority, but just there they, they do not check the certificate. This has been fixed, but at the beginning it was, it was this way. Um, the list itself contains also the public key. You see it on the, on the bottom. The pub key is used to check the signature of all images. So because we can push our own uh, configuration file, we can push our own images. In this list, there are also the keys to encrypt the images. That's a simplified version of the recovery process, but because we already presented at previous conferences and we don't have time yet, um, it's, it's enough to understand how to flash the femtocell. Now that we have a femtocell, we want to see what's possible to do with it, because we somehow have access to the telecommunication network, which is something that not a lot of people have. The first attack that comes in mind when you have some, some sort of transceiver station or antenna is to, to use it as an IMSI catcher. An IMSI catcher is just a way, so your phone connects to this device, you can get his IMSI, that's his identity number of, uh, stored in the SIM card, and you can intercept his communications and so on. This was very easy to do in the GSM because in GSM there's no mutual authentication, meaning the phone has to authenticate, has to prove that it's really the SIM card from this operator, but the, the, the operator doesn't have to authenticate itself. Meaning in GSM, the phone doesn't know if the BTS or the, the antenna is really an operator BTS. In UMTS, this has been patched, corrected, so now the, the phone has to authenticate the operator. And <clears throat> that's why uh, it's a bit harder. But we'll see that the mutual authentication actually is useless because it's not the, the cell itself that's authenticating. It's the operator network. But our cell is connected to the operator network, meaning we just get the authentication token from the operator through the, through the network and forward it. That's why we don't have any issue to be IMSI catcher. Uh, mutual authentication is possible. We always get the credentials from the operator back end. How we do it? Now to transform it to an easy catcher, um, the, the FantoCL itself provides a web interface. Normally it just has a simple web interface where you see the status of the FantoCL, nothing interesting. But then the vendor has a hidden web interface. If you know the URL, you just connect to it, and you even don't need to have the credentials. Normally there's the login page, but once you get somehow a cookie, you just can uh, access this web interface from the vendor, and here you can configure almost everything in the FemtoCell. Um, generally, how to fake another operator is just you, you change the MCC, the mobile country code, and MNC, the mobile network code. The country code tells in which country you are. 208 is France because we have the French operator and the mobile network code 11 and the mobile network 10 are, stand for SFR. So now I can change it to any operator. I can be a Deutsche Telekom or anything else just using this web interface. I can also change the nickname here, the, the default nickname, and then we'll see uh, anything else on the phone. So, so change the, so IMSI catcher is quite useful. Also, as we explained, the femtocell is just for you to use. So only registered users uh, are allowed to connect to the femtocell itself. The owner has a list. He says, okay, I want this guy to connect to the femtocell, and that's all. That's the closed access mode. Now we have two other modes. Semi-open access mode means that any phone from the same operator can use the femtocell. And open access mode means that any, femto, uh, any, any phone from any operator can use this femtocell to connect to the, 
to the network. And this is because also roaming is allowed on the filter cell. It's just connected to the normal core network as any other antenna. So if you connect to it, it works. And this way, we got really a full 3G MZ catcher. And all the authentication also works because we connect to a core network. The operator will just send us the credentials so your phone gets really accepted. And you have no idea that you're connected to a filter cell because we just said, yeah, we're just a telecom or, or just anything else. <clears throat> now we want to use the now we want to use the, this device to, to intercept the communication, to listen to what's going on. As we've explained, there is an IP, uh, a, a protected tunnel between the home node B and the security gateway, protect through IPsec. This is just because they don't want any, anyone to listen on the internet over this traffic. It's confidential traffic. There are some privacy issues. And the security gateway is also used to, uh, to authenticate the home node B. They just want femto cells to connect to the network. Nothing else. On our device, they use the client ExpressVPN. It's a proprietary client, and you don't have the normal tool you use on Linux to, to grab the keys. But this is just a tunnel. They draw only real on the tunnel, that meaning everything else is unencrypted. The voice is sent through an unencrypted RTP traffic. It's the classical IMR codec you speak also when you connect it to any other operator. It's nothing, nothing fancy. So what we do is we just hook the send to function. We're using LD preload. And when the client ExpressVPN managed the session and got the keys, he has to send it to the kernel so the kernel can encrypt the packets. And we were in between to listen to the keys, meaning that uh, once the tunnel is established, we get the keys over the network. And then we just decrypt the IPsec traffic. We extract the RTP traffic using RTP break. And then we transform the the stream, the, stream uh, the, the telephone communication, which is a stream-based IMR, into a wave-based IMR using a, another tool. And this way, we, we can intercept any communication once we decrypt the traffic. And that's what we, uh, we're going to show in the, in the first demo. Um, I'll change the cable. So this is, uh, this is our device connected to the femto cell, and as we've seen, we already changed the nickname. It's not SFR Home 3G, it's Hack in the Box. And now we're going to make a call. One, two, three. That's my Anthing machine. Uh, call. Now I have my call. I, you won't hear it just there, but I'm talking there, and I, I hear my answering machine. You've seen, the you've seen also the traffic on the left. So that's done. Now we're going to up, close. Ah. Line released. Now we're going to intercept. Get, away. Get rid of this one. Interception. Uh, we got the keys over the network, so now we wrote a, a little script who's decrypting all the traffic um, and who's e extracting the voice and so on. Uh, here we seen that previously we sent an SMS to test if it works, so we can also intercept an SMS. That's the number we got the SMS from. And there is the, um, the wave files, the decrypted files, and the stereo files. So now we're going to try to play the, the stereo file, which should be the, the call I just made. Is there no sound coming out there? P3. Enfin, tapez 0 pour plus d'informations sur votre répondeur SFR. Sinon, merci de raccrocher. So that's the French, my, my voicemail box, and we just intercepted the communication. Um, we're going back to the slides. That's the other laptop. So we've seen we have an MC catcher. We can just take any operator, and we can listen to any calls or see any traffic because it's unencrypted. Um, when they sell, sold you NTS, they said, yeah, it's encrypted. So you don't have to worry. Actually, yes, the communication is encrypted, but only between the phone 
and the femtocell itself, or the phone and the antenna. That's the over-the-air encryption. Afterwards, because normally it's a trusted network, everything is in plain text. There is no encryption uh, behind the, the femtos, the, any antenna at all, and that's also the case here. Um, to establish this encryption communication, you have to, uh, to get the keys from the uh, operator. And here the operator is just sending an ONO message, which, because it's not specified in the standards, it's a security mode command. So he sends the key and says, okay, you can uh, cipher the communication between the telephone and the femtocell using this key, this credential, and that's how also you do the, the mutual authentication. So you can also use this one to decode the over-the-air traffic and uh, the over-the-air communication. That's the only one encrypted, and that's why we can also intercept it. If you want to see more about that, because it's unspecified, there's some more detail how, the, how this message, which is usually a RENAP message, using the core network, but not so interesting. Now I'm going to, Nico is going to speak about more details about the communication itself. Um, okay. So um, intercepting traffic is, is a nice thing, but what's, what's more interesting if you have access to, to all the signaling and to, to basically to all the radio messages is playing with uh, the signaling traffic. Um, on a femtocell, uh, there's a standard for this, uh, which is at least used for this femtocell, but which also uh, became adopted as the standard for femtocells. Um, which is the so-called uh, Generic Access Network Protocol, also known as U UMA, which stands for Unlicensed Mobile Access. Um, and what it is is basically it, it maps all Layer 3 messages of, of the 3G protocols to a TCP IP-based connection. So whenever a phone um, opens a channel or is requesting a service, then this, this is a GAN protocol message that is uh, carried over this TCP connection. And you have one TCP connection for each individual subscriber that is currently locked uh, into the cell. And that's basically what you see in, in, in the lower image. So on the left side, you have the typical uh, Layer 3 um, call control and short message, and this is mapped transparently to the GAN protocol and then tra transferred to the GAN controller, which is the home node B gateway. And yeah, and the usage of, of the GAN protocol is totally transparent for the phone, so the, f the phone doesn't notice that this protocol is being used. So in order to play with this protocol, we've uh, developed uh, basically two pieces of software. On the one hand, we have written a proxy that is uh, proxying the scan protocol in both directions, so from the femtocell to the network and uh, from, from the femtocell to the phone, the traffic. And the only thing that we needed to do to use this proxy is reconfigure the home node B gateway server on the, on the web interface that um, Kevin has already shown. Uh, additionally, this proxy is able to differ between message types, which uh, will be important for uh, certain attacks that we are going to show. And the second part of, of our attack toolkit is a, a client that is communicating with this proxy over an, an extended version of this GAN protocol. And, and in combination, they are implementing various attacks. So what kind of attacks or what kind of stuff can we actually do? And the first thing that com came to our mind was modifying traffic. So it would be nice to modify SMS content or modify phone calls. And for the ease of implementation, because uh, playing with SMS is way more easier, because in SMS are only based on signaling messages, and we don't have to care about the RTP stream that Kevin mentioned. So for the first demo, we are going to uh, modify an SMS message. And this is actually based on the GAN protocol, really easy to do. What you see here is a Wireshark um, output of, of an SMS message. And on the, on the top of that, you have just a tiny um, UMA or GAN header that is identifying the type of message. And then you have the layer 3 message, which, like I said, is just the normal 3G um, message that is encapsulated in the scan protocol. So you have the text of the message, you have the number, and all the usual encoding. Nothing, nothing, nothing special for GAN. So what this... In order to modify an SMS message, our, our attack line just registers with the proxy and is telling the proxy that it's waiting for an outgoing message. And whenever a victim sends a message, the proxy just happily forwards the message to the attack client. The attack client features a full SMS encoder and decoder, so it it's just decodes the complete payload um, and uh, re-injects a message that um, is encoded according to our needs um, into, back into the network. So our client is able to uh, modify the destination address or the text of those messages 
And yeah, so nothing too fancy, but we are going to show it anyway. Um, all right, let's switch. Um, okay, is it visible? No. Okay, so what we actually have here is, um, ah, no, you, you should show this. Mm. Let's move this up a little. So, ah. so here we have uh, this attack client that's just specifying the IP of the proxy. Then it's specifying an attack type, which M stands for modify, and a text message foo to, to a certain number. So what we are going to do now is send a text message which contains bubble to a test number, which is actually this phone. Uh, you don't see anything again, I'm sorry. Okay, I switch back so you just see that it's actually bubble. We send this message to the phone. So in the background you see that the attack client is waiting for a message. We send the message on, uh, we send the message. Now it's on its way. You should see some traffic on the left side, which is the signaling traffic. And now the SMS is on its way. You see the content and uh, the modified values. Yeah, and actually now <laughs> the other phone uh, got the message. And it's, uh, yeah, and it's saying uh, foo now instead of babble. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Okay. That's modifying traffic, but what's way more interesting from our perspective is impersonating a victim or injecting traffic that isn't originating from, from any victim. And the, so, for example, you could do free phone calls or use a premium rate SMS services and make, make some money by using such a femto cell as an attacker. And the problem that usually happens in, in telecommunication is whenever you request a service, the network is asking the, the client to authenticate itself. And this authentication is always based on a secret key that is stored on the SIM card. So if we want to impersonate a victim that is currently locked into our cell, we, we have a problem because we don't have the SIM card of the victim. So here's how it goes. The attack client first is uh, requesting a channel. So it can... so. In this demo, we, we use SMS again. So it's requesting a channel so it can uh, send an SMS. Afterwards, like I said, the network will request um, an authentication from, from the client, which we obviously can't answer. And we solve that by s sending a paging request from the proxy to the actual victim. A, a paging request is what the network usually uses when there's an incoming service, like a phone call or a message. It just notifies the phone, the, hey, here's a service. So. For the victim phone, there, there isn't any difference between getting this from the real network or from, from our proxy. So we'll just happily answer this paging request. And afterwards, the proxy again asks the victim to authenticate itself to the network and can do that just by forwarding the authentication request that we originally received. And the phone, again, can't differ that this is a message that is coming from us. So it will just happily answer this uh, authentication request, verify it, and reply with the correct answer. And um, after this point, we are fully authenticated as a victim. So whatever we can do is possible. We can inject SMS, we can do a free phone call, we can use any, any services and uh, be authenticated. So in this, in this demo, we are going to show you how to uh, send an SMS message which is not coming from a victim. But again, this is not limited to SMS. It's just because it's easier to implement. Uh, yeah, so what you see now is, uh, again, this client. This time it's with the attack type I for inject. Uh, yeah, with the text hacking the box. And we send this to, I think, uh, which phone is it? I don't know. All right, let's. So the client is now requesting a, a subscriber information from, from the proxy, which is either an IMSI number or a TIMSI number. Okay, actually everything happened already. Um, after, this is, after this is done, um, 
And, and you don't see, you, you've seen the phone, so the pending request came in and the user has uh, no idea that any service came in. It, it was just blank. So the user is not notified that we use his service for, for doing anything else. And here we have Hack in the Box. So the sent message that we injected arrived on our phone. Yeah. All right. Sure. No, it okay, and uh, the question was if we, if we play with the message that the victim sent. And no, in this case, we sent the message on our own. So this is no message that the phone sent, but that's a message that our attack client sent. And this works because uh, we can authenticate on behalf of the, of the victim by forwarding the, the by, by paging it and forwarding the authentication request from the network to the victim phone. And when the victim replies, we are fully authenticated and can do whatever we want. Yeah, <laughs> I think Let, let's move it to the end because also it's it's hard to follow for the other people now. I think. Um, okay, but that's attacking local subscribers that are currently booked into our cell. So what about attacking other subscribers? And there's actually an attack that is not new, which has been discovered by Zuvan Minot and was also pre uh, presented in 2010, which is the so-called MZ Detach attack. And what happens is you send an MZ detach indication message to the network, and after this point, the, the network assumes that you have switched your phone off and you aren't registered anymore. So every mobile terminated service, which is either a call or an SMS, is not um, transferred to the phone anymore. So it's a denial of service attack. And this is until the victim actually reboots the phone. And however, um, there is a limitation. So this attack is. Um, this attack is working because this is, the message itself is not authenticated, but the limitation is that um, it only works in a certain geographical area because you send the message to this, the so-called visitor location register, which is always serving a certain geographical area. So whenever I want to de detach uh, a victim at the other end of the world, my local VLR will just ignore this mes message because uh, the victim isn't using the same VLR at the time. Um, so this is not nice, but in, in the case of femtocells, it's a bit different because this proximity constraint doesn't exist anymore because uh, the femtocells reside in various areas. They are all over the country, so, and, and they aren't as many as subscribers in a normal network. So usually, and at least in, in the SFR network, and I guess it's not very different in other networks unless there are lots of femtocells, um, there is one VLR that handles all femtocells, so the proximity constraint isn't there. And by using the GAN protocol that I already described, we can also send these IMSI detach messages via the proxy to the network and thus um, detach any subscriber that is currently using a, femto a femtocell if, if we know the, 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 yeah, either the, the IMSI or the TIMSI. And <clears throat> okay, we're also going to show that. So I'm calling uh, this mobile, which is currently booked into our cell and the French number. Let's see if you hear that. Take some time. Yeah, the phone is ringing now. So now I'm going to send this message with uh, the tool you see there. Also takes some time. And now I try to call it again. Mm. Yeah, so that's his uh, voicemail now. 
And uh, what you see here is that the telephone still thinks he's connected. So the user has no idea that anything is not incoming. The telephone still gets the signal from the normal beaconing from the femtocell itself. It just the femtocell never tells the telephone, okay, you're not registered, because the phone normally says, I don't want to be registered anymore. Okay, but uh, this is attacking other subscribers. So what about attacking, what about doing some, some network attacks and actually attack other femtocells? So therefore, we looked at the attack surface that is exposed from, from the network view, view, to the network view of an attacker. And there's basically two interesting things to look at, which is, on the one hand, uh, network protocols, and on the other hand, the services that are running. And network protocol-wise, there isn't too much interesting stuff there. On the, on the one hand, the device is using NTP, which is used as a clock source to provide frequency stability. And on the other hand, it's uh, using DNS to, um, to resolve the, um, the name of the recovery service. And while both of these protocols are vulnerable to spoofing attacks because they are based on UDP, it's not too interesting because even if you manage to spoof the recovery server, you still would need a method to, to actually trigger the rec recovery process. So what we looked at were the, the, the services that are running on the device. And basically there are two. You have a web server, which is serving the web interface that Kevin has already shown, and there is a TR69 provisioning service. And this is not device specific. The TR69 provisioning protocol is used for all femtocells. And both are based on HTTP. TR69 additionally uses SOAP and uh, XML. And I mean, uh, looking at the history of, of web servers, there have been lots of bugs. And while both of these protocols are not really complex, they are also not trivial to implement. And the, it's also interesting to attack these services because like on most em embedded Linux services, all of, all of the services run as root. So we actually look at the web service because I don't like uh, XML and SOAP too much. And we started reversing the binary, which is called VSAL on the box. And after some time, we noticed that this is actually based on, uh, on an open source web service, which is called SHTTPD, which was later relabeled to Mongoose and is also the basis for a com commercial embedded web server. And eventually, we also found a bug, which was a stack-based buffer overflow. In this case, it's not a zero day anymore because we already presented it at Black Hat. Um, but this exploit allowed us to root any femtocell because direct communication between the femtocell is also not prohibited within the operator network. Um, yeah, if for those who are interested, the exploit is at this URL. And like I said, it's no zero day anymore and actually there's a firmware update which fixes this bug. But it's nice because using this, you can basically uh, leverage all the all the modification injection attacks from your local femtocell to remote femtocells and basically control communication of other devices. Uh, yeah, we can also show that. It's not too fancy to see, but basically we start, we start a netcat on a, uh, that's listening to a pod, a small Python script, and now we are root on the device. And what we could do, for example, but there's probably way more uh, harmful stuff, is using this command to dump, for example, the subscriber database, which in this case only has one phone registered. Um, yep. All right, and then again, we went back to, to look at this web interface, because like I said, direct communication between uh, femto cells is not prohibited in the network. And what this web interface basically leaks is uh, the, the IMSI number and the MSISDN, which is the normal telephone number of the phone. And this is obviously a privacy problem, but becomes handy for the IMSI att detach attack that we demonstrated. Because by just scraping all of the web interfaces of all femtocells, and there are about 5,000 5, in the SFR network, we can detach the whole network at once. And we are not going to show that, but it works. Um, so by looking at the web interface, there's also another information. Because what, what you see here is um, basically the network code, the country code, the location area code uh, of um, cells within the neighbor area of, of the femtocell. Because femtocells do a location uh, verification, and that has uh, three reasons. On the one hand, 
the operator only requires uh, frequency licenses within a certain country. So they have to be sure that the devices actually also run in the country, in this case in France. On the other hand, if you manage to run this device in another country, you, it, it can be really useful to avoid roaming charges because right now we can use this device here and call a French number and we are not roaming because the device or the operator assumes we are in France. And the th third reason is actually law enforcement because in telecommunications it should always be possible for the operator or for law enforcement to determine if you are, if you're using a phone where it actually is. So, Usually you would assume that you could just use GUIP and this stuff to verify locations, but it's foolproof and even, uh, even using GPS is not easy because in, in buildings it's difficult to get a proper signal. So what they, are what they are using is scanning the surrounding neighbor cells and just by seeing the network co code, the country code, the location area, you can find out where the device is. And we use this information to uh, um, to scrape all the all the femtocells and find out where they are. Well, not, not all in this case, it's only 500, but that's how it looks. And do you want to say something? Yeah. So here we have some femtocells. We see it's a French operator. Most of the femtocells are in France, and we could also access to the web page. So we have the IMZ and the email of the femtocell itself, but we have also the telephone number of the owner of the femtocell. So we know exactly where he lives. We can know exactly also when he communicated, when there was any traffic at all. That's clearly a privacy issue, actually. Yeah. All right, I hand over to Ravi again. Okay, so just a short recap. So what uh, we achieved so far, like we can route this box locally, we can intercept call, we can send SMS on somebody's behalf. I mean, you can just spoof your, uh, your girlfriend a message or anything. Just pretty easy. So what about uh, doing something globally? Now, we know that all these boxes communicate each other. So no traffic, so there is no uh, firewall or anything inside it. And we know that we, have, we can route this box remotely also, as Nico told you. So we have a root exploit. So what we can do, we can route the remote boxes and we can change the address of OMAP server. If you remember, OMAP server means we can push a firmware to a femtocell. So what we could do, we can change the firmware address, we can give our own address, and we can push a malicious firmware that we have. So it will have a root access, everything else is open. And we can also change the GAN server address, where the all femtocell diverts their traffic, like call traffic, everything goes to the GAN service. So we can change, and what it means, any femtocell can be flashed with our own firmware. And this allows us to divert all the traffic of any femtocell user to our femtocell. So it means we can intercept SMS of the SMS call traffic of everybody. So it's like totally global control of all the femtocell network from SFR. Uh, also, uh, there are some other services, like while exploring the femtocell even inside the network, we figure out that the servers uh, where the all information store all are running open source software, such as MySQL, SSH, NFS, Apache. And, uh, it's, it, and all these services have been provided by vendors, so operator doesn't know anything about these services. They just configure and it's open source, like the Apache, they have an indexing is available. So just go open that uh, address and you will have indexing, what the information they have stored on the server, everything. For example, this is, uh, there is one server in femtocell network which is called performance measurement. So all the activity which is happens inside the femtocell, like how many calls it has been made, how many video calls it has been made, what is the uptime, what is the downtime, everything has been sent periodically per day towards the server, uh, to this performance measurement server actually. And uh, this is sent using a FTP account. And for all femtocells, they have fixed username and account, username and password, which is uh, which is just written inside the database actually. So we can just access that server and we have information of all the femtocell. Like Kevin said, there is a privacy issue. Like we can see how many calls he has been made, how many video calls he has been made, all the information we can see. And plus there is interesting information. That is, we can have an IMEI number of each device and a serial number of each device of all the femtocell. And the last four digit, like your vendor has been said password of last, like, last four digit of IMEI number is a password of every femtocell. So you can just know all the password of femtocell. I mean, routing is also easy, but the last four digits are password, so that's also a privacy issue. And also they use VSFTPD as a package, and you know that these are the system users. And you can just easily log as a SSH user easily into the system. Uh, and also there is a one more interesting factor. So this femtocell has a SIM card, 
right here. So you can insert SIM card. So when it's connected to a security gateway, it authenticates SIM card and it connects and it, then it allows the service. But how about, so what all the attacks we have shown you are based on a femtocell. So we need a femtocell to make those attacks. But what we could do now, we can take this SIM card out, have some SIM card connector, connect to our laptop, and yeah, it's possible. So we can change, we can have IPsec client, we can have a SIM card reader, we can take out the SIM card and we connect our laptop to security gateway. So right now there is no limitation what kind of attack you could do a femtocell. So all these attacks, what Kevin and Nico, Nico said, we can do this attack from our own femtocell, our own laptop. So we don't need femtocell, in, we don't need femtocell anymore. So and there is no separation between the network now, uh, between the operator network, because we can easily be inside the telecommunication operator network using a laptop and SIM card, and that's it. So there is no nothing to protect now operator's great wall actually. And I also want to add that in, in the case of the SFR femtocell, it's not, it doesn't even require the SIM card of this device. Actually, we found out that you can use any SFR SIM card to connect to the to the security gateway. Like any normal SFR SIM card, just take that, put it into the laptop reader, and you connect to the network easily, and then have all the attacks what we have shown you. Uh, and what it gives us to us actually by connecting this laptop easily. So we can easily attack some operator network, also signaling attacks. You can easily scan inside, or can see, okay, have an map inside, check what's going inside. Also, uh, we have, it, it has been given us one interesting feature, that's the HLR queries. I mean, we can, uh, Nico has already told you the GAN proxy. We have a GAN proxy, we can inject SMS. It means we can also send some random queries to HLR. Like we want, you can send somebody's MC and it will send back to us, okay, if you want to authenticate, so these are the authentication token, so you can authenticate. So we can have these random authentication tokens, which as we are getting a valid output from HLR, so we can just have a free HLR queries, and it also gives access to us to play around the core network and other access element. Uh, and what it concludes actually, so there are some other guys also who has done research in the femtocell, like uh, THC, they played with the Vodafone femtocell in 2009, but they published last year all their results, and also Samsung femtocell, this is from US actually, which is the CDMA 2000. Uh, they also found the same problem. So what it clearly shows, so this is not a problem only SFR has, so this is the problem in a femtocell architecture. So only it's not a configuration of femtocell or the operator. It's like the way they have, like the way 3GPP has designed femtocell architecture. So there are some defective uh, parameters, or you could say security-wise is completely broken, the femtocell architecture. The way they have been passed keys, or uh, they always trust this device. I mean, they have extended their coverage to a home premises. So they trust this device, but this device is no more secure. So there's just a weak security, but still they trust this device. So you have to know that in the telecommunication field, they control the whole network. So they put trust in each element. They don't have to re-verify if it's the real element, is the traffic really coming from the real source. They know, okay, it's my infrastructure, I don't need to control. Now, internet is completely the opposite. Everything has to be secured because there are bad hackers, bad attackers, and all on the same. And that's why they always wanted to separate the telecommunication network from the internet network. But now with Cell, they put some part of their equipment, some part of their infrastructure, in the user's home, and they connect it over internet. So once you gain access to, to their telecommunication network, the separation between internet or any other network and the communication network is, is, is somehow broken. And the design that having a just based on trust in the in the net telecommunication network itself, it does not apply and has some important security um, as leaking aspects. Okay. So uh, that's it for, for the research, and we would also like to thank uh, Professor Zeifert. So we worked under him actually, and uh, these are our colleagues, so there is no sequence, and Dia Tispar and uh, our great underground friend, that's K2. We all thanks for them. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? You had a question. Can you repeat it with the microphone then? Or? This guy. Yeah. yeah. Or a new one? Yeah, new one, no problem. <laughs> okay. Okay, we go for a new one. Let me see. Okay, you have a new one? <laughs> so, <laughs> so you just say that the problem you found there are not related to a single operator. So it's not a problem of SFR or Vodafone or whatever. So it's a problem of the design of this uh, femtocell. So 
the problem you have identified, uh, I hope they will be fixed sooner or later. So who is in charge uh, of uh, maintaining or fixing these femtocell protocols? So mm, the problem we found are uh, only uh, the, the ability to root it or to flash it, the femtocell itself, that has been fixed. We are still under control of our femtocell ourselves, but on the new femtocells, if you don't know exactly how it works, you cannot flash it again. So the de you cannot compromise the, the device. But afterwards, in the network itself behind, you cannot really fix it. And SFR don't care about securing the, the services behind the security gateway because they say, okay, we want just that this device is secured and the vendor, Ubiquitous, is responsible to, to give the security that nobody access his, his, uh, his core network. So we found some bugs. They have been fixed. There are other bugs. There, I think there will always be bugs where, you can, bugs where you can root the device or flash the device and access the network itself. And you cannot really secure the network. So like the GAN proxy, you cannot do anything against the GAN proxy because you, you don't know if it's coming really for the phone or if it's coming from the proxy or from the femtocell. You cannot verify the origin at all. It's just by design. Okay, so we should assume that uh, the, OP, I mean, the, the administrator of a femtocell actually has the possibility to, uh, to do the attack you are just describing. So, I mean, he can uh, send SMS or he can capture telephone traffic and so on. And I actually, suppose you have your femtocell installed in your, in your company to provide the support to your, uh, to your users. So the administrator of, of a femtocell actually has a full power. Um, the administrator will always be powerful. We, 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 always, or we also told the bugs, and most of them are fixed. I think if somebody is looking further on, it's still a bit secure, but you will always find some flaws. So you cannot do anything against it. And also there is a big problem with these devices, like they have to keep the price very low, vendors, to make a business. So like if they are giving for 50 euros, so what will be the price for this box? So you cannot have really extra hardware security features. So you have to trade off between security and cost. So that's a challenge for the operator actually, to give it an extent, security-wise. Any more questions? Yeah, hi, good question. Um, does that, do you need to break the EKI? Which is the GSM SIM encryption key? So, um, KI, which is in GSM and not in, um, is stored in the SIM card itself. It's used to, to do the authentication. We actually don't break it at all. We have the SIM card, so we just ask the SIM card, please authenticate yourself. Like we do for the SMS injection, we just ask the SIM card, please authenticate yourself, and then we can send it. And um, the KI is just used for the encryption from the phone to the femtocell. Now we control from the femtocell to the network. There, nothing is encrypted. So, so we don't need the encryption key. So actually, okay. actually, KI never leaves from a mobile phone, and we don't access mobile phone. So KI always remains inside the phone. It doesn't go towards femtocell any, any time. So we never break it, and we don't know KI. That's always a secret. Ah, secret. Okay. Uh, anything else? Anyone? Any more questions? No? Okay, so last comment uh, we have actually, so after our Black Hat talk, we wanted to publish all the information, what we did, all the tools, like whole wiki explaining what we did and how, in what fashion. But due to some legal constraints, till now we haven't been able to publish because we're still fighting with operator and also vendor. They don't want to publish some information, some information they want to strip out. But finally we made a deal. So hopefully after, I mean, after the one week from today's, next week, all the information should be available on this URL. And Nico has already published his root exploit, you can see from his blog, definitely. And uh, all the information about wiki and procedures will be available on this URL uh, next week, for sure. Thank okay. you very much. Uh, Thanks. Uh, Thanks, fine. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, and also just to mention, the PowerPoint slides that he's showing right now, it's also available on uh, our material section of our conference website. And it should be available in the next two minutes because we're uploading it right So away. we have a six minutes, so last point. So we could say that the femtocell are very small device. I mean, you cannot make very big attack anything. But what we could do, we could also add extra antenna, which can increase the power. So it means that we can just increase the range and have any user to force to book our femtocell, and we can just spy on him. So we can also do this feature easily. That's an extra add-on. Thank you very much.